You're watching Swipe on the show this week. We're going underground to find out how the internet keeps flowing. Who's afraid of broadband jargon? I'm about to make it easy for you. And Star Wars returns in this week's Games Review. It's not often I get to present Swipe wearing a plastic onesie. But this week I need all the protection I can get because I'm going down there. You might not know it, but the Victorian sewers beneath me are crucial to keep London's internet flowing freely. There are thousands of miles of tunnels down there, so there's plenty of room for fibre optic cables. Here's Will. This isn't the kind of place you'd usually associate with fast broadband. These tunnels were built in the 1860s to take care of London sewage, but now they're being reused to speed up the internet. Unlike other systems that loop around the city, the sewer network allows cables to run straight through the middle of London. The guys come in and what they do is drill and clip um, the, the clips onto the brickwork. Um, they'll go and do a whole run, maybe four or five hundred metres, and then what they do is float these cables down the sewer and then they actually walk along and just clip it in as they go. So they'll lay all the clips first, then put the ducts in afterwards once it's all laid. Many of the people who rely on the sewer's internet cables work here, for industries like banking, data storage and gaming, a high bandwidth is really important. And basing the network in the sewer should make the connection more reliable. These cables stretch out for over 900 miles around these tunnels. And just like any other connection, if something goes wrong, they need to be fixed. But for that to happen, somebody sitting thousands of miles away needs to flag it up. This map shows the global network run by Zeo, the firm that owns the cables in London sewers. And over in Oklahoma, people working in the network control centre monitor the entire system. If something goes wrong, they take action and the issue gets fixed on the ground. But putting cables in the sewer means the chances of things going wrong should be much lower. The average street in London is dug up something like three times every year. The sewers don't get dug up. The sewers are a safe, benign uh, environment, uh, ranging between you know, a metre to 15 metres or so, 20 metres below the surface level. Um, We've not had a single collapse, for instance, in the sewer, causing any uh, cable da damage in the 10 years of operation of the sewer network. They may have been here for over 150 years, but as London grows, these tunnels could turn out to be more useful than they've ever been. Will Sargent, Sky News. Well, now I've come down here. And actually, once you get over the smell, it's not that bad. It's pretty fascinating, not only being in a sewer, being able to see the cabling that makes getting online possible. Although broadband as a topic can sometimes be a little bit complicated, can't it? Not everyone knows their fibre optic from their ADSL, for example. So here's a little something I prepared earlier, a broadband jargon-busting breakdown for you. Let's start with ADSL. This is the slowest kid on the block, but typically the one most of us in the UK have at home. It's delivered via copper cables. It's fine for the odd bit of web browsing and emailing, but the speed gets worse the further away you live from a telephone exchange. Enter the fibre optic option, the kind we've been looking at in London sewers. Its higher speeds of up to one gigabit per second mean you could download an HD movie in around two minutes, something that would take about two and a half hours with an ADSL connection. And while we're talking speed, the government wants to see super-fast broadband rolled out to 95% of the UK by 2017, using a mix of copper and fibre optic cables. That'll enable speeds of at least 24 megabits per second. Now, if you happen to live somewhere fairly remote without a fixed cable connection, you might already be familiar with satellite broadband. You need a dish to pick up the signal, much like the dish you use to get Sky TV. And then there's 4G. When you're using the internet on your phone while out and about, you'll either be using a 3 or 4G connection. It's mobile technology, but you can use it on a computer at home by getting a hub device or dongle to connect to the web. <sighs> Back in the fresh air. That clean London air. Now, while I go and get unclipped, here's a roundup of some of this week's tech news. The European Space Agency's first British astronaut has taken some time out from space training to talk about his upcoming mission. Tim Peake held a Q&A with London school children this week to try and get more kids interested in space. One of the pupils wanted to know if he was ever lonely up there. 
you know, there is the potential to get lonely in space because although I'll be up there with five other astronauts, the space station is actually a really big place. It's about the, the same size as a, a 747, the internal sort of living area, about the size, size of a jumbo jet. And it's quite possible to be working all day long and not actually see anybody else. Um, but something that's really important as a crew is to come together um, and we normally do that at meal times and just be able to relax, eat a meal together and socialize so that you do get that, that feeling of, of company and uh, to prevent you from getting lonely. We expect a lot from our phones these days. They've got to function well, look good, and of course, they've got to float. Well, at least that's what the engineers behind this phone reckon. Comet, which is currently on Indiegogo, is described as the world's first buoyant smartphone. The makers say you can take it swimming or surfing. A pub owner from the Midlands has come up with an app that could help eliminate the risk of food poisoning when eating out. Matt Crowther's Temp Checker app is aimed at kitchen staff and sends notifications to chefs, reminding them to check food temperatures when produce is delivered, stored, cooked and served. If they don't, the manager gets an alert. Now, we've got a mobile games review for you this week. Guys, picked a few titles to play on your phone. You can tell immediately with Nibblers that it is the new game from the makers of Angry Birds. It has that kind of cutesy, really well made, really obviously expensively animated uh, introduction. It has the exact same kind of mission menu screen. And crucially, it has that kind of three star reward system, which as far as I know, I'm a games expert, as far as I know, uh, Angry Birds invented that, but it's, it's certainly popularised it. So it's got all of that, but crucially it's not an Angry Birds style game, it's actually a Candy Crush style game. It's, as far as I've seen, the, you know, the, one of the better Candy Crush clones that's out there, and it is an incredibly popular game, an incredibly popular genre. The problem with it is, that, that I find, is I think I'm pretty good at these games. Eventually, you're going, no matter how good you are, you're going to hit a wall where you, can, you, you, you keep failing it, and you only get a certain number of retries per day unless you put down money to unlock more lives. Star Wars Uprising is a pretty standard Diablo-style dungeon crawl role-playing game. You know, it's pretty standard, quite repetitive and boring gameplay, but the really interesting thing is what it does with the Star Wars universe. The citizens of the Anuid Sector embrace their place in the Empire. Star Wars Uprising is a free-to-play game that fills in the gap between Return of the Jedi, so the last sort of chronologically speaking, the, the last film, and The Force Awakens, which is coming out at the end of the year. Like I say, the gameplay itself is very, very standard. You kind of, you pick a character, you customise them, you take on missions in this world, and the missions tend to be very repetitive. You go here and sort of kill a few of the, well, try and assassinate a few of the, um, the not the stormtroopers, but the enemies, the, the, the empire, the new empire that's in this game. What makes it really interesting is that it, it, it fills in the story from those two particular films. It's pretty well written, it's not voice acted, which you wouldn't really expect from a free to play game. Um, so you, there's a lot of reading to do. But it's it, if you go in, if you play this game and then go into the new film, you're going to be really well educated on the setup and the story. Raceline CC is a new game from Rebellion, who are the makers of the Sniper Elite series, a British studio. Had a lot of success with this first person shooter, and they decided to go and get into mobile games and make a racing game. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty, like, it's, it's very much like CSR racing in terms of the gameplay. It's very simple. You tap the screen to kind of get your revs going at the beginning of each race, and then the idea is to slipstream behind cars and move between cars before you end up crashing into the back of them. And, and that's the entire kind of gameplay loop. What's really interesting about it from my perspective is that it's, uh, it's a new game that's for iOS 9 devices only. So we're talking about the most recent iPhones and iPads on the last sort of last few generations and for that reason it looks absolutely spectacular so it's a free-to-play game that looks really 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 nice the thing that I found maybe a little bit annoying about it is it's free to play so you'd expect that there'd be lots of ads in it but there are so many ads in it and you have to spend £1.49 at least on in-game items to remove those ads but I think that's probably a fair asking price for what you get in this game oh right I think it's time I went and had a shower See you again next time. Bye-bye.